Uh, I think we're going to get started. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's patience and I apologize for the, the late start. Um, I'm Noah Lenstra and I'm just going to just help us, help us get on the road. Um, and again, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm just going to start um, an event like this in the past. We've, we've started by reading what we call a Community Technology Manifesto. So I'm just going to start by reading this. It's just kind of a document that we use to kind of communicate about why meetings like this are important and why it's important to continue conversations about technology um, in the local community. And if you want to access this, it's online at eblackcu.net slash portal slash manifesto. Um, so I'm going to read this. Uh, so we dedicate ourselves to become difference makers. An information revolution is underway, leading global transformation in health, education, business, culture, and in, in, and in the diverse activities of our daily lives. This revolution cannot and will not bypass any underserved or low-income community. Every person in every neighborhood is impacted and therefore challenged to act. We rely on cyber democracy, collective intelligence, and information freedom. Cyber democracy means universal access. Every person in every community organization able to make full use of new technologies. Collective intelligence means hearing all voices, all of us uploading as well as downloading. And information freedom means online information is findable, easy to use, and requires no special permission to access. With these values, we will work together so all our communities and community organizations can communicate, represent themselves online, and use digital technology to create cyber power for social, social change. Um, so this manifesto originated in Toledo, Ohio, and have supporters across Chicago and Champaign-Urbana. Let's do it. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, uh, our moderator, um, professor of African American Studies and, and uh, the chair of the African American Studies Department at the university, um, Professor Ron Bailey. Um, and, and Professor Bailey is going to introduce the first panel and, and take it from here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was a, a member <laughs> of the group that met after the meeting two weeks ago to kind of work through the agenda. And I do had a conflict this morning, and so I got drafted to fill in for him, so I want to do that and just kind of facilitate the meeting. Uh, and you, and I, I want to apologize also because we didn't get a copy of the, the agenda out, but the way it's structured is this. Um, as you recall, there was a lot of questions about uc to be, and so we wanted to invite representatives from um, uc to be here to talk about recent developments. And so we have two representatives. Um, we are going to have some rapid reports from four or five people doing work. So we're all kind of up to date on ongoing initiatives. And then I think the most important part of the meeting, I'm calling looking forward. You know, and that's a panel discussion that Brother Artis is going to share, a chair that has to do with what can we do with UCB? What kind of ideas do people have uh, in particular areas? Uh, and then we'll wrap up and have a period of networking and then we'll, we'll um, meet again to lay out the agenda for uh, our next meeting. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce uh, Mike Smeltzer and Sabrina Gosnell. Um, they are representing UCDB. I think you know both of them pretty well. Uh, there were some pretty important questions last week that had not been resolved. For example, the extension of the deadline for grant activity. Uh, there was also the issue of the possibility of getting Wi-Fi um, initiatives uh, for the community, and then some discussion of private versus public, co-op, and that sort of thing. So these are some of the issues that we wanted to hear from UC to be on. So with that, I'll introduce Mike and Sabrina. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good. I, I won't stand up then. I'll, I talk better when I'm sitting. Um, we did get the extension. Uh, that's the headline, I guess. Um, we have now until September 30th to complete the grant-funded construction. Um, there are, well, the other part of that was also that we got, we asked for and we got permission to add another 61 anchor institutions to the official list of anchor institutions. 
Uh, the maps you have before you still have the old version of where the all the anchor institutions are, but the back now has the full list. Um, there, we're working on the new map that shows all the new ones, uh, but we added a bunch of churches, uh, some medical facilities, uh, some places that, quite frankly, should have been on the original list, but somebody screwed up, and that, that was me. So by getting this additional list approved, we have atoned for my past uh, problem. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, the contracts we had with our construction companies all expired at the end of January because we thought that was going to be the end of when everything happened. Um, for what's going to happen forward in terms of construction, uh, we are going to go out to bid uh, probably in early April, um, and we will end, I don't will end up with a new construction company, but we'll end up with a new contract for people to do the work moving forward. There are these new 61-acre institutions that we've not done any work on. There are probably, I'm going to say, 200 locations that didn't get connected for one reason or another. There were people that already had signed up. Uh, and there are still some anchor institutions that were in the original group that have, for one reason or another, not been connected. That construction will happen conceivably as early as June. I'm telling people July, just not get their hopes up too high. But it just takes a while to go out for bid. And, evaluate the bids and get all the approvals and all that. So by the time a new or at least a new contract contractor is here, uh, it could easily be late June or early July. But that still gives us three really good construction months. I mean, February is not a great month for doing construction anyway. Uh, and with the amount of work that's left to be done, that's plenty of time to get that work done within that window. We are continuing to take subscriptions. You know, we tried to cut off subscriptions for December 15th so that we would have a a list for the current contractors or the old contractors to work on. Uh, that list kind of dribbled on. People were still signing up as, you know, into early January. March 1st is now the cutoff for everyone. If you're sitting on the fence, if you live in one of these yellow areas that are eligible for the grant, and, you can't, and you're thinking, do I want to do this or I don't want to do this, you've got about three weeks to make up your mind. Because March 1st is the end uh, of taking subscriptions. We will give these new contractors a complete list of all the sites they're going to install. Last time they had to bid on a, an average cost. And we said, well, we're going to have 2,500 homes and this is where they are, but we don't know where they are yet. This time we're going to be able to tell them exactly where they're going to install so they can go and see this one's going to be easy, that one's going to be hard, this one's going to be real hard, this one's going to be real easy, and they can make their bids appropriately. Uh, so the list has to be pretty much cut off in early March so that, or the first of March, so that all that paperwork and all the maps and all those things can go out in the bids in early April. So if you know people that are on the, on the fence or if your church is in this area and is on this list and hasn't signed up, this is their opportunity to get that fixed. After March 1st, we will be out of selling mode and we'll just be strictly into construction mode. Um, so we've got a little lease on life for people that missed it the first time or maybe just moved to the area or whatever. Uh, there's still an opportunity to sign up for services in those areas. There's not an opportunity to add any additional anchor institutions to this list. This is our list now. Uh, one of the downsides of getting the extension was on the day they granted us the extension, they also locked the project. We can't change anything. We can't change our budget. We can't add things. We can't move money around. Our, our, we got the extension based on the definition of our project at the day they gave us the extension. Now, we got these extra anchor institutions through the day before, so they all count. Um, and they, they, they knew that wasn't a gaming. They, they knew that. They knew we wanted to do this, so they approved them in that order. But their rules are that when we get the extension, that defines our project until the end. Now, we can still be doing construction all the way up through September, or, you know, midnight of September 30th. We just can't incur any additional expenses starting October 1st. We've got about three months to close out the project at the end to get the bills from the contractors and the lead waivers and all things that have to happen there. But construction will probably start, I'm going to say July 1st. Some people say, you got to say June. I'll say July 1st, and if we show up at your house in June, you'll be happy. Um, rather than the other way around. So there's still that opportunity to sign up. Uh, a couple of the other things that Ron mentioned, um, expansion. There are discussions that will be going on this month and for the next several months with four organizations that in one way or another have expressed interest in helping UCB expand to other parts of town. Um, those discussions will kind of pick up steam as we move through the spring. Uh, ultimately, we hope to end up with a single partner out of that that says, yes, we're willing to invest the money and the time to build fiber everywhere. There's probably people in this room that live in places that aren't in the fiber-funded areas and would like to get UCTV service or at least fiber service to their home. 
Uh, we're hopeful that that process will lead to that happening. Uh, there were three principles that we asked of all the organizations that expressed interest in building out. One of those ones, it had to be fiber. We wanted fiber to the home to be the, the core of this. Uh, the second was it had to be an open access network so that once it's built, other providers could provide services on it as well. And the last one is that they had to commit to building to the whole community over a reasonable length of time. A reasonable length of time, maybe four, five, six years, but you know, not 30 years, not 50 years, that within the foreseeable future, uh, we would hit every single property in the city limits of Champaign, Urbana, and Savoy. Um, and those are the three kind of core principles. There's lots of other little things, but those are the three biggies. And thus far, the organizations that have submitted their proposals to us have all, they know that. So they wouldn't have bothered submitting proposals if they weren't willing to at least come close to doing that or maybe do that exactly. Um, Ron mentioned wireless. Um, we have asked MTIA for permission to use grant funds to do some different wireless things. And that's a little bit contingent on having enough money to do that. One of the, one of the reasons for cutting off subscriptions on March 1st is so that we have a defined list of what we're going to be spending on fiber installations. When we get those construction bids back, we'll know exactly what that's going to cost once we have a, a winning contractor. If we have money left, um, there are three different wireless initiatives that NTIA has said are approved that we can, they did that two days before they gave us the extension. Um, and one of those is to build a canopy or a cloud, if you will, over all the areas that are represented here in yellow on your map. Um, that's going to be tricky and it may not be perfect. Uh, our contracts, well, all of our current customers say that we can come back and add some wireless equipment at their home to serve the area. It wouldn't be on their connection, they wouldn't be sharing. It's not like your next door neighbor would be hopping on your home connection. It would be a separate SSID, it would be a separate service. Um, we don't need to put equipment on every home. If there's three UCB customers in a row, we might put one on either end so they cover the ends and they don't need to worry about the middle. There's a whole design aspect to that. That could cost upwards of a million dollars to cover that whole area with a ubiquitous wireless service so that no matter where you went through there, your, your laptop or your iPad or your iPhone, smartphone, whatever, would just plain work. There are some areas where we don't have customers on whole streets. Nobody signed up on that street, so that's going to be a hole in the coverage unless maybe the streets on either side happen to have customers and we can get the signal to go through there. So it's, it's, not a perfect, it's not a perfect system, but over time, the more customers we get, the more likely it is that we could have a ubiquitous wireless system. So that's one of the proposals. These three proposals will ultimately, the UCDB Policy Committee, of which Abdul is a member, I don't know if anyone else in the room is a Policy Committee member right now, um, they'll have to vote and determine how they want to prioritize these three. The second thing we asked for was the ability to go into some of the senior centers, uh, Round Barn Manor, uh, Florida, um, Sunnycrest, and there was one more, um, uh, Edge of the Mall, um, and offer them Wi-Fi services within those buildings, uh, actually in the living units. Those, those buildings are all connected to UCDB, they have fiber, and they'll have you know, a little access point maybe in the library or in the lobby area so people can go downstairs and use it. But it's much more valuable to have it where you live, to have it in your, in your bedroom, to have it in your living room. Um, and so it, that's not an overly expensive project, but those areas aren't in where the areas where we, those particular facilities aren't in the areas where we're building fiber to the unit per se. So we're looking at a Wi-Fi solution for those senior centers. And of course they have to want to go along, but two of them have already expressed interest in doing that. Uh, the last one is to wire up the anchor institutions that are outside of the fiber of the home area and make them hotspots. Uh, put one, two, maybe three or four antennas on the outsides of the buildings so that residents that are live somewhat around them, you know, you can't go very far. I mean, you can get antennas that go very far, but your laptop, the antenna in your laptop doesn't go very far. So even though you can maybe see the signal, it can't see you coming back necessarily. But a couple hundred feet, uh, maybe a little further would, would certainly work. Uh, and kind of create those as hotspots so that it, would be a, it, would be, it wouldn't be free, it would be a paid service, but it would be a very inexpensive paid service. So the people that lived around, let's say, a church or a school or, uh, I don't know, pick something else, uh, the sanitary district or even, uh, that they could get access to a community Wi-Fi service that would work on all those places. In a perfect world, it would be the same authentication engine that worked in the yellow areas, in the senior centers, and in all these anchor institutions. So we start to build 
a, basically a community Wi-Fi umbrella that's everywhere. And if in the, in the fullness of time, if we get a partner that wants to build out fiber to more areas, we start adding more and more antennas, and sooner or later, you'll hopefully you'd be able to go anyplace in Champaign-Urbana with just a Wi-Fi. You wouldn't have to have cellular service, and you'd have internet connectivity through Wi-Fi. That's a five, six, seven year project, but you gotta start somewhere, and this would be a way of starting. Um, we would be doing the anchor institutions in the yellow area if we did that, uh, you know, the grant funded area plan already. This would be to add, you know, there's about 140 that are outside of those areas that would uh, be added to that. So those are kind of the big updates of what we were talking about with NTIA. Um, there are the contractors that did the work in phase one, which was putting the rings throughout the community, and phase two, which is doing the fiber to the home. They're finishing up some things that are maybe half done or almost done. Um, but there'll be kind of a, a window where there won't be much construction going on for a while uh, until we start up again with the new construction contract, which will be hopefully June-ish. I'm doing all the talking. Uh, Suprina is doing a lot of the support. If you're a customer now and you call in and you've got some sort of issue, uh, sometimes they can solve it over the phone, but sometimes this ends up on Suprina's desk and uh, people will get to know her and the team that's working with her on helping with those kinds of issues. My guess is you guys have got questions and you'd much rather get your questions answered than to hear me talk. Do you want to hear Sabrina talk? All right, vote for Sabrina to talk. I do have one question. I was sure. curious. It's Wi Fi. Uh, <clears throat> is it, would it be, I mean, the fiber optic, is, and that, that's a lot quicker than the standard cable and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But would that Wi Fi also be quicker, considerably quicker, or would it be about the same? Well, the, the key know. to this is that in each if you had, do you have UCB service? No. Okay. If you did, um, the ONT, the little box that hooks up to the fiber in your home, has four ports in the back of it. One of those ports is what your router that your home plugs into, and we would take the second port and plug a, a separate Wi-Fi antenna into that. So the fact that there's fiber feeding the, the that second service makes means that it can go as fast as the radio can go. Now, is Wi-Fi as fast as fiber? No but it's still pretty darn good if you've got a good connection to it in the first place. And it kind of depends how close you are. You know, there's a lot of variables. But if you live next door to somebody that had UC to be and they had one of these community antennas on their home, you probably have pretty good coverage in your home. So if for some reason you, let's say you rented a home and your landlord didn't want fiber being put in or you didn't want to spend the $20 a month, but $10 a month for a Wi-Fi service was, worked for you, you'd be able to do that. We've got some situations where there are, there are areas of town that didn't qualify for the grant where people on one side of the street qualified for the grant and people on the other side of the street didn't. Due to no fault of their own, but that's just how the lines were drawn and it's, that's we were stuck with that. If the people on the other side of that street use the Wi-Fi service, they'd get some benefit out of UCGB. It's not as good as fiber, but it would certainly be better than nothing. Um, and it's gonna be very affordable. So. It's a way of adding a little extra benefit to for the fiber customers because they now have a mobility aspect that they can go down the street, use their use their service in other places. But it's also a way of kind of expanding the customer base a little bit and hopefully reaching some folks that for one reason or another don't sign up for fiber or couldn't sign up for fiber or just couldn't afford the fiber. I guess my, my question is comparing what the the Wi-Fi like say like Comcast had has mm -hmm. right now, would it, is the fiber option considerably faster than what Maybe Comcast is offering right offering right now, or do you know the answer to that? Well, Comcast, if you have Comcast service and you have a wireless router in your home, your Wi-Fi is based on your Comcast service, and it'll never go any faster than your Comcast service because that's the limiting factor. This will have a much bigger pipe to the to the radio in the first place, so it has the potential to be much faster than Comcast, just depending on what your Comcast. It will certainly be faster if you're sending things. If you're doing a video conference with somebody or just a, a, a video chat your picture will be much clearer going to them because you'll have better bandwidth going outward. So it could be much better, yes. It, it, I can't know if we can guarantee it'll be better. Almost your mileage will vary. And the... But the, your coverage here actually looks sound like the, the, coverage. Coverage, the coverage actually be broader too. Right, and, and the other thing is, is that <coughs> it won't be ubiquitous. I mean, it won't be everywhere. If it works for where you are and you want to sign up for the service, great. And if you can't get it, you won't be able to get it. And once it's fully built, that's pretty much how it's going to be for a while, unless we figure out some way of expanding. So it, it won't be a perfect solution for everybody, but it'll be a reasonable solution for some people. Uh, and it's a way of leveraging the fiber and, and helping some of the neighbors in the areas around them. Someone had a question in the back. 
Could, could you just identify yourself, please? My name is Marlon Green. I'm a resident at 1404 Hedge Road. And as I sit here and listen to you explain uh, what areas we see uh, UCDB and what areas didn't, I would like for you to explain to me the determining factor behind what areas were eligible for it because the area that I live in is north of the tracks of an area that we see UCDB. The street that I live on alone, there are 14 people in online training programs out of their homes, mm -hmm. um, educational programs. For, so for our area not to receive this service was appalling to me. Um, from what I gathered as I followed the UCTB service and the grant writing process and the, when you guys received the grant, from what I perceived, it was a grant to put um, internet access to disadvantaged families, low income families, into social services agencies that provided services to these families. So for an area that I live in as a renter not to receive this service, I'm kind of, you know, in between and asking questions as to why we did not qualify for UCT. That, that's, a, that's a great question and you may not like the answer, but I can tell you exactly how that was determined. Um, this is a federal grant, or the core grant is a federal grant, and the federal government does everything by census block groups. Um, every 10 years we do a national census, figure out how many people are in the country. And the year before that, the federal government asks each community, they ask Champaign, they ask Urbana, to define neighborhoods that are kind of like each other. Um, and those, those don't change a whole lot over time, but sometimes they do. I mean, it used to be downtown Champaign hardly had any residential stuff in it, and now there's all kinds of apartments and things, so that area has changed. But in two, we were using the, the census block groups that were defined by the 2000 census. We, and this all happened in 2009, so the data was about nine years old at that point. But the census block group lines, what's in and what's out, and that, that's what you see here, our census block groups, um, that was defined in the 2000 for that census. What NTIA said was that we could do fiber to the home in areas that were underserved with broadband. And they had a very strict definition of what underserved meant and what broadband meant. And so literally in July and August of 2009, we had people going door to door. There may be some people in the room that, that did that, knocking on doors and asking people, do you have broadband? And if you have broadband, who's your broadband provider? And all that data was brought back and we had to go through, and as long as a census block group had 41% or less broadband adoption, they qualified for the grant. If they had greater than 41% broadband adoption, they didn't. And what happened in some areas, uh, certainly say North Lincoln Avenue in Urbana, there are some big student apartments there. And those student apartments have had broadband for years. So there could be, say, 300 low-income homes that are there, and there's 400 student apartments well, if you have 400 student apartments with broadband and 300 homes that didn't have broadband, there's no way you're gonna get that under 41%. So in some cases, it was kind of counterproductive. The more likely you were to have broadband in 2009, the less likely you were to be able to have the grant. We originally thought before the grant application process started that they might base this on income. And so we did a lot of pre-mapping because there is strong evidence that shows the more money you make, the more likely you are to have broadband in your home. So we did a lot of mapping early on. Mark Tolson from the city of Champaign was involved in that. And we looked at what happened, let's say if the average family income in a census block group was $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, what would all be included in the math? And there are some definitions of poverty and we looked at the federal definition of what the poverty level is and two times and three times and, and what qualifies for the school lunch program. And it was, it was kind of crazy. And if they'd come down to just income, somebody was gonna have to make that decision. I, I was really scared there was going to be me that had to make the decision that said your home gets it and your home doesn't get it. But I didn't want that responsibility. I didn't, I didn't think that was particularly fair. Well, it turned out the federal government saved me from having to make that decision because they let basically people vote, if you will, by their own behavior. And the areas where people had not adopted broadband, for whatever reason, they're getting the grant. And for the people that had that slightly more than 41%, uh, they did and we, we knocked on as many doors as we could. We tried to be as inclusive as we could. And to be honest, we even used, when you do a survey, you don't knock on every door. You knock on some percentage of doors, and there's, there's a plus or minus factor. Well, we used the plus or minus factor to qualify some of these areas. This would have been a much smaller map if we had just taken the raw data and said, all right, 
This one was 42. Well, our plus or minus was like three or four percent based on statistics and so forth. So we had some places that were maybe 46 percent, but if you take the plus or minus, they qualify. We stuck them in there because statistically that's a valid thing to do. We tried to make this as big as we could um, and expand the rules as close as we could. We got right up to that edge of going overboard, and this is what we ended up with. Was I happy about this map? No, I didn't like this map at all because there are neighborhoods just like yours. I can probably guess where you live based on your description um, that are not on there. And if you look at your home, you look at the homes either way, but they're similar. But now, that now if we think about the first principle that was read in the manifesto, cyber democracy meaning, means universal access, and then think about your questions, we're in a position now as we move forward to, to deal with that, to figure out how the wireless umbrella can be used to cover your neighborhoods, to cover the neighborhoods and the situations in the community that people that the community thinks should be covered. So when you say there are a group of people doing online learning and so on, what better community, what better group of people to get plugged into this? And I think that's the importance of this extension, the wireless possibilities, and then what the community does beyond the funding in September to address some of those issues. So I, I wanna I wanna keep us thinking about okay, this is the grant. That's going to terminate at a certain time, and we need to be prepared and clear about what we, how we want to move forward to address the kinds of problems that you just mentioned. That's why that's such a good a question. It kind of reminds us that we're going to move forward beyond this grant. And, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why one of those three principles for negotiating with expansion partners is to do everybody. Not, no redlining, no saying, oh, well, we aren't going to make enough money there, so we're not going to do that. That's how the existing phone companies and cable companies offer their services. Uh, and they're public corporations, they have shareholders, I understand they're doing what they're doing, but it doesn't help us. It helps them, doesn't necessarily help us. We want the whole community to be wired in a very similar way so that you have equal access to this no matter where you live in Champaign-Urbana or Savoy for that matter. And if, if, if you would just make sure, if you would, after the meeting, if we could identify kind of where your address is so that we can think about you know that as a case study of what the, the impact that the wireless umbrella might might have yes we are uh, garden hills yeah we're garden hills okay. we're, we're north of the railroad tracks so you have you're uh, probably area, right next right next nine four ninety four that area is covered right but north of those railroad tracks i mean no one ever knocked on my doors and i've been in my home for four years no one ever knocked on my doors i mean i was waiting the day that I learned that I was not going to get UC to be, um, it was uh, one of the city councilmen coming by to introduce himself that he was going to be running for the area. When I learned that we weren't going to get, I thought he was coming to tell me it was time to sign up. So, mm -hmm. so you're um, in that little area to the east of 309 and to the west of 110? And when the city of Champaign drew the census lines in what would have been 1999 for the 2000 census, they try and keep census block groups around the same, and, and Champaign and Urbana do it differently. Urbana census block groups have about 500, maybe 600 homes in them. Champaign ones tend to have about 1,000 homes in them. And so somehow your area there is part of a census block group that extends down to the south would be my guess. Um, and when they surveyed all the people in that census block group, there were more people probably to the south that had broadband that brought your percentage up, and that's why that area didn't qualify. It, 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 it wasn't a perfect system, and... But it, it can be solved, though. It can be addressed easily. Uh, easily addressed. Yes? Um, is it correct that both school districts are signed up, so all the schools listed here are getting connected? Yes. Um, Urbana schools, with the exception of King School, already had fiber between all their facilities. I guess King and what's on north of Broadway, is that Washington? Mm -hmm. Right. King and the Washington. The two predominantly black schools. What? The two predominantly black schools. Right. And, and quite frankly, that was just a matter of when Urbana was doing that, they had, it was very, it's very expensive to cross railroad tracks and it's very expensive to cross the boneyard. So they, and all the things they connected, they had never gone north of the boneyard or gone north of the railroad tracks. Which is normally where poor and black people live. UC2B is going to connect to those facilities, I think already has actually, um, 
So all of the Urbana schools will be part of this, and but the Urbana schools can already have their own thing, and they're going to kind of keep doing their own thing, and this is going to get add that those two schools to what the Urbana schools are doing. Champaign schools had fiber between their facilities, although they built a new school in Savoy that didn't have it, and that now does. Um, they were doing that through AT&T. They're transitioning to a UCDB-based connection. I want to say there's three buildings that are left to get hooked up there, and then they'll, they'll do all that at once. Most of the private schools, uh, I think actually all the private, I'm not aware of any private school now that hasn't signed up. So Canaan, um, Countryside, you name it, all of, uh, what's the Lutheran, uh, St. John's, all of those are all signed up as well. And it's all the same system. And once everybody gets up and rolling on this and we have all the peering and everything worked out, which will take a month or two, um, you'll be able to get from an Urbana school to a Champaign school very quickly. You'll be able to get from an Urbana school to Parkland or from a private school to a Champaign school. So the, it opens the opportunity for some communications and collaboration that just didn't exist before. I have another question, but I'll wait for her. Oh, I, I have nothing to add. There's nothing to add. So this is, I'm not sure if it's more theoretical than practical. Um, universities seem to keep finding ways <laughs> to interfere with the progress of the black community, sometimes more than helping. And I say that in relation to this, in that um, as, you could probably even call it gentrification, so as this, these new student apartments get built and begin encroaching upon the traditional African-American low-income community, here we see one of the consequences is neighborhoods end up not qualifying because the students are counted, because those buildings are counted, where the traditional residents don't even live there. It's like two different worlds, but this privileged world ends up hurting the disadvantaged world. Does, has that been discussed? That's certainly the case in Champaign-Urbana. I know there are other university towns that may have faced the same thing. Has that conversation take play, taken place? And if so, what are some of the proposals that came out of that so that negative impact can't continue? So um, that, again, that speaks to um, one of those principles for expansion and the fact that there's no redlining, meaning that every part of the community will be built to. Um, in terms of those discussions, um, I, I can't speak to whether those, whether those discussions have happened. Um, well, I, I want to know who came. Okay. Well, certainly we can speak to the fact that going forward, we are building to the entire community. That is, that is the plan, that is the goal. Um, in terms of, of you know, the grant-funded portion right now, um, we are limited. Uh, but we are being, we are attempting to be creative, right, in terms of, of the wireless canopy and things like that. One of the things that the city Bailey, are, you're following what I'm saying, correct? It's a larger sort of democratic theoretical. Theory. Well, I mean, one of, one one of the issues with high speed broadband is it changes the discussion about the usability of land. I mean, people actually relocate because there's faster internet service, and so. You know, we not only have to be sensitive to what's current, but you know, when you look at real estate developers, they can pitch apartment complexes and so on. So I think that, 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 that that's part of what most cities take into account, and that's certainly got to be taken into account in this discussion. So you don't get that kind of new disenfranchisement, you know, based on technology, not based on voting anymore, but based on technology access. And I think that that's the that's the power of the approach that this group is trying to develop. One of the things that both local communities can do, uh, it goes back to this whole census thing. The federal government allows Champaign and Urbana to define their census block groups. And for instance, um, Shadowwood Trailer Park, or Mobile Home Park, excuse me. That's a census block group all into itself because those that the homes in there are kind of like them, each other, and they're not like the ones across the street, and they're not like the ones in the south. If Urbana wanted to, uh, in North Lincoln, they could make a census block group out of just that student apartment complex. So any federal programs that are based on census block groups, that doesn't affect the people that live right next door that aren't necessarily in the same world or the same income strata or anything else. And unfortunately, that only happens every 10 years. And because we did this in 2009, we were dealing with lines that were drawn 10 years ago. 
it, the timing was just bad. Now, I don't know, I'm told, I haven't looked at what the new lines are for Urbana and Champaign. They moved a few things around, but I don't think they made radical changes. <coughs> what you're suggesting, I think, could be taken up with each of the communities and saying, look, where we have a, a real diversity or a real difference in what this is, look, let's make this one census block group, let's make this something else, or let's draw the lines. And the, the goal is of the census is to have a census block group that has similar situations residentially. That makes perfect sense. That's a very powerful point. I'm going to date Thanks. myself here. 1980, we did a big conference on the census undercount. And the big issue was poor communities, black communities, communities of color not being counted. And, you know, I don't think it ever came up that we should try to impact how these census groups are shaped. So that's something for this group to take up moving forward. You've got a, like an eight year head start, or what is it? You've got a seven year head start on the 2010 census, I guess. Uh, but that could have radically different lines, and it could be based on the exact things you're suggesting. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Kate Williams. I'm on the faculty at the University of Illinois, and I was involved in data collection about the local institutions and organizations that are the pillars of the community, what they were doing with technology over this past year, because we thought that if we knew what the status quo was, that would help but boost all these organizations to a higher level. So this work has been given to UCDB um, so that they can be guided by it. Well, there it is on the front table. Um, and it's also online for free. Um, but the thing I want to raise is that not only was UCDB unique in the sense of they were building this fiber really widely, but they were also bringing it to people's homes, unique in the sense of all the projects funded by the federal government, it was also unique in that the local um, entity, the cities and the university together, determined that there should be a community benefit fund to, to guarantee that there can be some amelioration past all these, like you would say, techs, because it was a tech that the area south of the track didn't get in the yellow area. There are these techs that just happened. And um, so the community benefit fund is like a, a a portion, up, I think it's up to 5% of the revenue of this fiber project, because the fiber project is going to go on, is being set aside to fund projects which, which surmount the digital divide, which overcome the digital divide, which is going to persist, even after you see the B, which is not a be all end all, obviously. So, and I think that's part of the later morning's discussion too, so I don't want to go too far into it, but um, we're trying to be data driven because our data can be better than their data their data being the federal government, old census blocks, blah, blah, blah. We can, we can, we can overcome that. So I was going to mention this too, if in case you have not seen this, um, you can go online, it's mounted on a, something called IDEALS, I-D-E-A-L-S. So if you Google UCDB IDEALS, it'll take you to the online copy of both of these volumes and you can read about the initial set of anchor institutions and I assume some plans are going to be made to do a volume three to capture the new anchor institutions that have been made, that have been added to this now. One more question on this particular panel. Yes. My question is, uh, I signed up for UCB and I didn't have a computer at the time and I still don't have one. But I called uh, the company and they explained to, well I received a bill, that's what happened. And uh, I called the number that's on the bill and they explained to the lady that I didn't have a computer, but I had talked to someone, the reason I signed up before, and told them I didn't have a computer, but I had planned to get one, I had started taking lessons, and she said that it was okay to go on and have it put in, and when, after it was installed, um, I wouldn't get a bill until I called in for it to be turned on, but I'd get a bill, 1999, and I want to know what's going on with that. <laughs> The, we offered that to people, and I don't, whoever explained that to you didn't probably explain it the way they should have. Um, back when we started doing, really taking subscriptions, probably about a year ago, um, we knew there were going to be people that didn't have a computer, or there could be people that had a, six months to go on their contract with AT&T, or six months to go on their contract with Comcast, um, and they wanted to switch to UCDB, but they didn't want to have to pay for two services at the same time. So what we said was, you could delay your billing until February or January 1st, actually, so that by the time the grant ended and we had to tell the federal government how many customers we had, we'd have that many customers. 
uh, but that the July, January 1st was as much as we could delay it because that's when the grant, the grant ended on February 1st. Now that we have this extension, there's no reason we couldn't, if it's installed, you know, it, I take it they installed the service at least, there's, there's stuff in your home, um, there's no reason now that we couldn't extend the period where you've got it and you're still learning and getting get your computer and all that, we could, we could push that till September 1st now. But up until a week ago, we didn't have that, op that wasn't an option until we got the extension. So you'll want to talk to Sabrina, um, she can make that happen. So let's thank Brian and Sabrina for, I'm sorry, Mike and Sabrina for their presentation. And I just asked Mike, what we probably need to do rolling forward in, in a month or two months is have another discussion on wireless as this unfolds and UCDB understands how much money it has and they get a better grip on these options to come back so that we can get a better feel for what the possibilities are and, and get community input. I want to use the question that was just asked to segue into the next uh, set of presentations um, because once we get universal access, the next big problem becomes getting people machines and getting them classes to know what to do with those machines. And so your point about not having a computer even though you're taking classes. So the point of these next four or five, what we call rapid fire presentations, was to hear some presentations of people working on those kinds of problems. And so Brian Bell from Parkland is going to talk about classes and machines. Uh, Carol Lewis from Salem, Salem Baptist Community Lab is going to talk about her work with the um, seniors in the, in, the, in the church lab. Noah is going to talk a little bit about cyberspace and E-Black CU. Brian on the local wiki. And I think New Hope is going to share with us some of their work on working with their labs and kind of as a model for what churches can do. That's, that's, that's fine. Okay, so would you guys, uh, where's Brian? Brian? Yes. So these are rapid fire short reports. That's what the, what the committee mandated last week, right? Five, five minutes. No, less than five minutes. Uh, hello again, um, my name is Brian Bell. I'm a part-time teacher at Parkland College. Um, here, here at three minutes to explain about three, uh, three great initiatives going on right now in the community that you can be involved in. Uh, one, uh, we have free computer classes available at Parkland College, uh, Monday through Thursday, three to five. Um, that's free, that's open for the, for the community. Uh, we have free, I have also with the, a program that I've developed over the years called Digital Equality Initiative. Uh, we have free computers to any nonprofit, any community, community organization, mm -hmm. or, commu or any yeah. church. I've mm -hmm. given away thousands of free computers That's over cool. the last five or six years now to those type of organizations. Um, these computers are made, uh, are made possible through collaborations with uh, local, local city governments and, and uh, some of our local corporations. Um, recent, we recently partnered up with the uh, IMC, which is the Independent, Independent Media Corporation in Urbana, to offer these same services. Um, I recently discovered that working together, we can accomplish some great things. Um, so our voices are louder if we, if we speak together. So could everyone say that with me? Our voices are louder if we speak together. Now that brings me to my, my third great opportunity, which, which is um, an example of a cooperative internet service provider. So here's what we know. Imagine um, we can create an internet service provider okay. that's owned by the members of the community. A co-op is a nonprofit organization um, that's owned by the members of the community, kind of like a credit union or some of our local grocery stores. Um, Co-ops support the local economy by hiring local. So when you pay your bill, that money is bouncing around our local economy and set up somewhere in Texas or Philadelphia. Uh, by coming together, we have the, uh, we have, by coming together we can uh, get some things that we've always wanted. Uh, one is freedom. Another one is accountability, like uh, getting better things like service and support. The other one is choice and control. 
and the other one is a stronger local economy. So if you think that creating an internet cooperative or internet co-op mm -hmm. is good for the community, uh, please sign our mailing list in the back. So it's just saying that you agree with uh, how co-ops work and, and how it's better for the community. And also for free computer classes, free computers, affordable computers for the community. Thank you. So this issue of kind of the kind of ownership, public versus private, co-op versus utility, that's a big issue. I see why he wanted more time now, because he actually <laughs> went beyond machines. And so we'll, we'll have to schedule that as a fuller agenda item at one of the meetings and get a lot more discussion on that than we can do this morning, okay? Salem Baptist Church has had a computer lab since 9 computers and we have one laptop. We have their actual stations and it's been set up as a computer lab. Uh, we have a computer um, uh, uh, fiber committee with five members and we formed this and uh, with the policy and everything so that we have an official uh, community lab. Uh, it's open to the, pub, to the community. Anyone in the community can use our lab on a need basis or if they call us to set up an appointment so we can have the lab open. We do have, we've had structured classes, we've had open uh, nights where anybody can come in and work on, students come in and work online for their classes they're taking at universities and different things. We've had our youth and youth in the community use it for homework and different things like that. Uh, we have a, um, basic it's open for you to call us to make appointments. Right at the present time, um, we were talking about uh, training people to use their computers. When you get your computer in your home or you get hooked up, we, we, can, we can form any class that, that you would like to form if you let us know and we can form them. Presently, we have a senior class that meets every Saturday morning <clears throat> at 10.30. Uh, we have a full class right now and we, we, we take them at their level. In other words, they come into our class, some of them never touched a computer, some of them have used computers, but we let them work at their own speed. There's another class that's going to be beginning uh, in the middle of February from 9 in the, on Saturday morning before our class, from 9 to 10.30. This will be for anybody who would like to learn uh, basic computer, computer skills. That's going to start in the middle of, Feb uh, of uh, February. Um, presently, also, uh, the IR we have an IRS program that will be uh, start, I think, in another week. Every night from 5 to 7 during the week, there will be someone there to help you do your taxes, and that's free of charge. Everything that we do is free of charge. We don't charge anybody to come and take a class or to use our computer. We just have to schedule it so that we can have the time to do it. Um, I don't know what else. Everybody, everybody, it's a volunteer project. So that any, we also have been very lucky to have students from the University of Illinois to come in and serve as instructors and help us with the lab and so forth. <laughs> so I don't know what else you would like to know um, about forming a lab if you want to, or if you want to sign up for anything, you can contact me, Reverend uh, Journal Bogan, uh, and uh, Chris Ham, or Noah Lindstrom. They are the ones on the committee. So um, if there are any other questions, I would answer any questions you have about uh, you know how to form a lab or to come to you know come to our lab or anything like that. So, so let's, let's, let's do this. I want to change the, uh, so the logic was machines and, you know, getting classes, mm -hmm. and then uh, what are community institutions doing? And so we have a church talking about the lab, and I want to ask Pastor Nash to talk about what New Hope is doing, because what we're hoping is that you will hear models for what your church, your community group might do, and actually go and visit these institutions to do what Carol just said, that is, you know, talk to her about how to form a lab and so on. So that's that. Thank you. Uh, New Hope Academy has uh, two labs now. Uh, lab number one is has been uh, uh, set up for after school program. New Hope has had an after school program probably for eight or nine years. Before U60B came to be, we had a after school program with about eight computers. Uh, we 
partner with Unit 4 for about three years, uh, and it was open Tuesday through Friday from 3 to 5. And so we've had to scale back because we're no longer partnering with Unit 4, so we're having to finance the program ourselves. So we just open on Wednesday now from 3 to 5. And that's for the after school program. We have lab number two, and, uh, which is a community lab. Anybody in our community will be able to come to that lab and learn the basic skills of using computer. Uh, thanks to Brian Bell and company, we was able to uh, put 10 computers in, in that lab. Uh, thanks to the University of Illinois, uh, one of the Students there, uh, Jeff, Jenny, Jeff Jenny has been working with me, uh, setting up that lab. Uh, the grant that we received from the city, a uh, $3,000 grant, we were able to use that grant money to get that lab up and running. We, we were able to uh, bring in two licensed electricity who donated their time, but we had to buy all of these, the, the uh, tubes.